Well, now let's talk about a wine that didn't come in at 13 and a half. <laughs> but it's also a wine with an altitude. Well, the altitude. <laughs> Uh, I should perhaps have said that Irene's first vintage was 2003, and this next wine, the first vintage you know well, yep. was 1997. Yep, yep, know it well. The, um, this is a completely different camp, but you come from a background of not necessarily blockbuster wines, the refinement of Bordeaux, the, you know, the wines are sizable there, but talking about Claude Truffier, now, what is the deal with this wine? It goes back to 1996 when I met with the owner of Chateau de la Negli, Jean Rosé, who had been introduced to me by a mutual friend. He had a vineyard up in the hills at about 300 meters, 1,000 feet in altitude, in the little tiny town of saint pargoire that had been planted by his father, who was the mayor of saint pargoire He's the same gentleman, by the way, who set up Marlene Soria as a winemaker in the same town of saint pargoire hmm. Um, and he had had the foresight back in the late 60s, I believe it was in 67 and 68, to plant not Bourboulinc and Carignan and Aramon, but rather to plant Syrah mm. and Marsan. And there were almost nobody in the Languedoc planting those varieties at that time. But all of the fruit had gone <clears throat> to the local co-op and had never been uh, harvested separately and, and vinified separately to see what it could do. And Jean was finally able to do this, <clears throat> I believe, for the first time in 2006. Mm -hmm. But the yields were still cooperative style, well mm -hmm. over 50 hectares per hectare. But he had me taste the juice. And it was clearly some of the most complex, um, well-balanced, uh, captivating juice that I had tasted made from Syrah mm -hmm. anywhere in the Languedoc. And he said, here's my dilemma. Either I'm signing a deal tonight to sell this vineyard to a guy in Paris, this vineyard being two hectares of Syrah and a half hectare of Marsan, mm -hmm. together with 100 hectares of Grenache Blanc, uh, Saint-Sau, uh, Bourboulinc, and Aramon. And I said, well, Jean, I really don't know what in the hell we could do with the other 100 hectares. The time right. that it would take <laughs> to graph them over it could be five years and it could, it could be a catastrophe. Right. I said, isn't there some way that you could sell the other 100 hectares to this Parisian buyer, yeah. who hasn't even come down to see them, right. and carve out these two and a half, and let's do something special with them. Yeah. And he thought, well, yeah, I guess I could. Yeah, yeah. And did the Parisian guy even give a rat's ass whether, you know? It didn't even come down. Yeah. It didn't even come down. So we were able to do that, and I said, okay, now, Jean, we've got two hectares of Syrah right. and a half hectare of Marsan. Let's go to use the technical term, balls to the wall, mm -hmm. and every decision that needs to be made, let's make it in what we think will be the decision of highest possible quality. Mm -hmm. Because I said, you know, even if we screw up, it's two hectares and neither of us is going to go broke. Right. Uh, but I would like to show just how great and how much potential there is in the long run. Yep. And so we started with the 97 vintage and we harvested about 15th of October, took us two and a half days. And we called that first vintage homage à Max, because Max was his father who'd planted the grapes mm -hmm. and who died right about the same time we were harvesting. Yeah. So he never got to see the, the see fruit the <laughs> of, his, of his vine, so to speak. And we did everything that we thought at that time would be the best, best, best possible thing we could do to make the best possible wine. We, harvested everything by hand into small plastic crates. We moved it down to the winery, which was at La Negli, uh, in refrigerated truck. We sorted the fruit three times, first as bunches, then we stemmed it by hand, uh -huh. then we resorted, and then we had a final table where there was a last sort. And then by conveyor belt, it went into a brand new oak tank for its pre-fermentation called maceration, then fermentation, and then we ran off again. And I should point out that the macerations then were about 45 days. Today, they're closer to 60. Then we ran off into 100% new French oak barrels, thin staved, so that there would be a maximum amount of exchange between the air and the cellar and mm -hmm. the wine in the barrel. Mm -hmm. And we ran the aging out to, I think in that vintage, maybe 21 months, which was un maybe 24, which was unheard of in the Languedoc. Any mm -hmm. wines that spent more than 12 months in barrel was absolutely the maximum. And as we started to taste and to show the wine around, 
everybody was amazed. They couldn't believe that this had come from the Nongadoc. I mean, it caught lots and lots of people's attention. Uh, thankfully, it caught Bob Parker's attention, and I think he's probably got more of it in his setter than just about anybody else. To my great personal satisfaction also, it caught Manfred Crankle's mm -hmm. attention, and I know he's got quite a stash of it in his setter, and being one of the best uh, producers of Syrah anywhere in the world, to know that he's fond of this wine is a real source of, of pride for us. And it, you know, it's done well all around the world. It is quite the opposite of Irene's wine. It's, first of all, only Syrah, from what we think are the oldest Syrah vines in the Languedoc, having been planted back in 68. Um, we harvest probably the last of anyone in the Languedoc. We've never finished before mid-October. And very long aging cycle. And the wines have done very well in the, in the press and in a number of top restaurants around the world. It's a wine that I think, like they used to talk about the old Barolos, where you could open and decant them and serve them that evening, but you could keep the rest and serve it the next day, and it would be as good or even better. So. Any, uh, between 97 and 2008, any changes that you made as you went along in this process to see how the wine evolved and things like, eh, let's do this, let's do that. I mean, as yes. far as aging and barrel, that sort of deal. Um, it, it's funny or ironic, I think, because Shortly after we had completed the harvest uh, at, at Truffier and had gotten the wine into barrel, I met Michel Gracia in saint Okay, yeah. And prior to that, we didn't know each other. He had done exactly the same thing at Gracia, of which 97 is also the first vintage. He picked everything and then, then the destemming by hand and, and pouring the grapes into, into his fermentation tanks by gravity flow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was, it was Really amusing, and I think he also produced a rather remarkable wine for that vintage, which was difficult in, in, in Saint-Avignon and in Bordeaux. As far as changes that we made, yes, there have been a few. Uh, we tend to keep the grapes in a cold box for a good 24 hours before we begin sorting them. Mm -hmm. We no longer do hand destemming. We have a very sophisticated destemmer that does it automatically because we found that if we did have any gray rot in the grapes and waiting as late as we do, we may. Mm -hmm. That if we tried to do it by hand, we might still cause some of the uh, enzymes contained in the gray rot to permeate through the rest of the selected grapes and the consequent must. And therefore, we might have problems during fermentation, we might lose some color, etc. So we found that it was uh, more, ac not accurate, but more precise to use a really good sorting machine and then after that we still have two sorting tables mm. so that if we see anything suspect we can get rid of it and it's also much faster so we have less problems with oxidation because when we were doing it all by hand it was a, a two-day affair. Process, yeah. Yeah. Um, we still ferment every year in a new oak tank and I think that's important however when we do the matto now in barrels we've gone to using a combination of Bordeaux barrels namely 225 liter some burgundy barrels, 228, and occasionally something that Claude Gros, our consulting enologist and partner in the project, created called the Muy Duc, which is about a 340, a yes, a 340 <laughs> liter barrel. And we've also experimented with a little bit of Russian oak, but not, not so much on Claude Truffier, more mm -hmm. on two other cuvées that we make there, the Porte du Ciel and the Lancelie. Mm -hmm. uh, aging has actually gotten longer. We're out to as much as 27 months but we've gone to a slightly thicker stave. We were at 21 millimeters now, maybe 22, 24, mm -hmm. even as much as 27, so we slow down a little bit that exchange with the outside air. Still bottling unfined and unfiltered, and I think the wines have gained in precision, and who knows, perhaps they've gained in aging ability also. Mm -hmm. All we know, and you'll see this with the special offering you're about to do, is that all of the older vintages from the very first one, 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, they're all continuing to go very strong. And they all support decanting and, and being open for some time. Yeah, I'm tickled pink. We're going to rifle some of those older wines here at some point when we get them back in because uh, we found a, a special cache of those particular wines yeah, that we're good. pretty psyched about. Because I remember having those on release. Actually, I remember having this wine on rele uh, before release in a plain brown wrapper <laughs> with you giggling like a schoolgirl when you walked in. Uh, to the, to the place where I was working at the time, going like, mm, look what I have. Um, if you've never had a chance to try uh, Clos de Truffier, it is, it is one of the most unique, um, dynamic, uh, Syrah-based wines in the world. It bumps heads with all the top cuvées, regardless of vintage, and um, 
But you might think it's a little pricey for a Languedoc wine in the context of Syrah on a global level. I, for one, cannot bitch about the price. No. It's, <laughs> some people have indeed said that the price is high for a Languedoc wine, but the cost of producing this wine is as high or higher than any of the best Syrah in the world. Yep. It really is. And where our yields, we didn't talk about it, but they, they range from 8 to maybe 15 hectares per hectare. Which, eight? Yeah, unheard of. And I'm standard sure. Bordeaux? Yeah. Average in Bordeaux's, among good Bordeaux's, is 40 to 50. Yeah, do the math. I've done the math, I will continue to do the math, and I will continue selling this wine because it's really good for the money and I love it. I mean, using the new oak tank, the new barrels every year, that's also real expensive. And aging a wine for 27 months in barrel is tying up a lot of wine and cash. <laughs> and all of that has a cost. Is it released yet? Is it released yet? Is it released yet? Is it released yet? No, we have to wait. Is it released yet? No, we have to wait. We're just selling 2009 right now. We haven't even released 2010. Good Lord. Yeah. I will drink no wine before it's time. Orson. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for talking Languedoc. This is cool. My pleasure. My pleasure. The people should remember this is really where Grenache Syrah and Morvedra got their start. You know, it's I wasn't, I wasn't going to go there because it would go run a really long time. But because we could talk, we could talk for hours about this stuff. But um, but yes, you're correct. You're 100 percent correct, and I'm hoping that people will uh, glom back onto the wines in Languedoc again very soon. So, me too. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. Anytime.